I wonder when I look at some of these people, why the dilly God picked that guy? Do you ever wonder this? I look at someone, for, here's an example, it's like, it's like Jonah. I look at like Jonah. Jonah, a lot of us know the story about Jonah and the big fish. Jonah got swallowed by a big fish. But you guys, the whole book, the whole book of Jonah is about Jonah running away from God's call. It's about Jonah resisting God's plan to proclaim salvation to lost people. It's about Jonah pouting when he doesn't get his way. And every time I read this book, I think, what? why didn't God just pick someone else? Anyone else? You know, I, I look at someone like I look at someone like Samson in the Bible. And I know my wife Cindy disagrees with me on this, but I'm right. Samson was a terrible judge. He was a terrible judge. He, he didn't represent God well to the people at all. He acted rashly again and again and again. He let his emotions undermine his calling, you know? And what about Judas for crying out loud? Judas! You know, Jesus even points out the fact that one of his closest followers is going to betray him. And he points it out to Judas. How did he not see that coming when he asked Judas to be one of his closest followers? Is God really a good judge of character? Do you still say yes to this? Yes. Yeah, me too. I mean, the truth is, you know, I mean, the truth is God does see the flaws in people. He does. He saw the rebellious spirit in Jonah. He saw the emotional instability in Samson. He saw the selfish heart of Judas. And he called those guys anyway. Why? Why? You know why? Because God saw something in those guys that we can't see. In fact, you know what? He saw something in those guys that they probably didn't even see themselves. Because sometimes it happens that way, right? I mean, most of us, I think, are probably, you know, we think that we're at least above average in judging other people's character. But if I ask you how good you are at judging your own character, that's a different conversation, isn't it? Are you worthy of God's call in your life? Are you worthy of that? Well, I don't know. I am kind of screwed up. I have an interesting past. I'm not a good public speaker. I can't pray very well and on and on and on. It's hard sometimes, isn't it, for us to look at ourselves and judge our own character. It's hard sometimes. You know, and this isn't uncommon, right? You know, when God called out to Moses, 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 and said that he had a job for him to do. What do you think Moses said? I'm ready. I'm ready, God. I'm ready. You know what Moses said? He said, oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you've spoken to me, I get all tongue-tied. My words get tangled. Lord, please send anyone else. Moses said this. Please send anyone else. When God calls to Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah says this. He goes, oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak to you for you. I mean, I'm too young. I can't do it. I can't do it. Pick somebody else. It's not uncommon, is it? For people to see things differently about themselves than what God sees in them. You want to see what God really thinks about you, though? You want to see what God says about you? Turn to Ephesians 2 in your Bible. If you have a Bible with you, it's in the, in the New Testament, closer to the back, way back there. You could use your phone or tablet, of course, if you want to, or Bible in front of you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it up on the screen also. But Ephesians 2 is closer to the back. It's going to be like way back there, way back there. Ephesians chapter 2. So Ephesians is written by Paul. And one of the, one of the uh, recurring themes that you see in, in Paul's writings is the difference between the old you and the new you. Between your old life 
and your new life in Christ. Paul, Paul brings this up a lot. And so let's take a look at this, Ephesians 2, starting in the first verse. This is what, this is what Paul says. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for that, for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. No, so none of us can boast about this. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So you guys see right there what I'm talking about? With the kind of the old, new dynamic, the old you and new you dynamic that Paul's talking about? You see what I'm saying there? This is a big thing for Paul. And it's a big thing for God. So when we look at this passage today, there's, there's a couple things I really want you to remember about this passage. Things that I want you to remember about, about who you are. And this first thing is I want it to sit with you. I want it to sit in your spirit because this is really, really, really big. You are not who you used to be. This is what he's saying here. You are not who you used to be. You guys know, right, that people kind of like to judge us based on our past behaviors and past actions. You've experienced this before, right? You know, sometimes we do the same things to ourselves, that we judge ourselves by our past actions and past behaviors. But do you know that God doesn't do that? Paul says, once we were like that, once we were like that, but not anymore. And so when you evaluate yourself right now, when you evaluate who you are right now, you can't look at yourself through the lens of who you used to be. It doesn't work that way in God's kingdom. God isn't looking at who you used to be. He's looking at who you are becoming. You can't look backwards when you're evaluating yourself right now. And you can't listen to people that want to point backwards either. You guys probably don't know this about me, but I'm a huge Chicago Cubs fan. <laughs> what, have I mentioned that before? Oh, I didn't know that. I'm a big Cubs fan. And one of my favorite players on the Cubs is Anthony Rizzo. Love this guy. I know. Woo! Go Riz. I love Rizzo. But you want to know something about Rizzo? You want to know something about Rizzo? Rizzo starts every year in a slump. Every year he starts in a slump. And it's the most frustrating thing in the world to watch this guy whiffing badly at really terrible pitches for the whole first month of the season. But by the end of the year, but by the end of the year, he almost always is hitting around 300. He has 30 homers. He has over 100 RBIs every year, every year. What that shows is that Rizzo is always in the state of improving. And it would be a terrible mistake for him to keep looking backwards throughout the season and thinking to himself, what a terrible player I am. Look at all those strikeouts I had during the first month. Look at all those missed opportunities that I had. Wouldn't that be a mistake? Because Rizzo, who he was at the beginning of the season, is not who he is becoming. Do you get it? You get how it's the same with you? The same with me? Who we used to be is not who God looks at right now when we're holding on to Christ. 
who we used to be. It's not who we are. Okay? The second thing that I want to sit with you is what God does say about you, who he says you are. If God says you're not who you used to be, then who are you? And did you pick it up in this passage? Did you pick it up? Like what Paul says about you, how he identifies you? Did you pick it up? It's pretty cool. It says you are God's masterpiece. You are God's, just think about this. You are God's masterpiece. Other translations say you are God's handiwork. You are God's workmanship. But it's the same idea, right? You are who God has made you to be. Not who you used to be. Not who you used to be. But who you are right now in Christ is who God has made you to be. And he says you are his masterpiece. Now you may not feel like a masterpiece. <laughs> and I get that. I get that, right? I don't feel much like a masterpiece myself. Lose 15 pounds, then maybe. Just, just kidding. It would take way more than that. It would take a lot more changes in me for me to see myself the way that God describes me. But I want you to wrestle with the question here. If what God says about you is different than what you see in yourself, who's right? If what you perceive about yourself is different than what God says about you, who's right? Are you right or is God right? God is right. God is right. Which means that you are a masterpiece. You're a masterpiece. Even if you don't feel like it, even if you don't feel like it, you are a masterpiece. And I want you to understand this. You're not a masterpiece because you're a masterpiece by yourself. In fact, by yourself, if, if I'm being honest, you're kind of a mess. <laughs> I know, I know, right? Because I, I can say that because by myself, I'm even more of a mess, and I get that. But what Paul is saying, the whole point of this, is that you are not being evaluated by yourself anymore. You can't evaluate yourself by yourself anymore. You are being evaluated through the lens of a father who adores his son Jesus. And because of that, he adores anyone that is holding on to his son Jesus. You are a masterpiece because of who's in the picture with you. You get it? The last thing that I want to really sit with you in this reading today is why God did this. Why did God decide to make Tammy a masterpiece? Why did God declare that Larry is going to be a masterpiece? Why? Did God just feel sorry for you sitting in your sin? Was God bored one day and said, ah, I think I'm going to rescue some people? No. God had a reason for making you a masterpiece. There's a reason. There's two reasons. The first reason is that God loves you with an everlasting love. Even if you don't or can't or won't love yourself, you are adored by a God who has had a masterpiece vision for you in mind since before you were born. You are loved by God. But you are also made a masterpiece because God has a calling for you. God has a job for you. You know what that calling is? You know what the calling is? God, what God wants you to do? Display his artwork. This is what Paul says, right? Paul says that God wants to point to you in future generations to show what his grace and kindness look like. In other words, God wants you to show the world what a work of art from God looks like. Hmm? That's cool, right? I mean, it kind of sounds like we're just supposed to stand there and look pretty. God did this. <laughs> right? But that's not what God is saying, right? That's not what this is about. What Paul's saying is you are to be a living masterpiece. See, right? Isn't that what he says? So you could do the things that God had for you to do. God wants us to show the world what grace looks like in action. What kindness looks like in action. What love looks like in action. Listen, this is a big one. What Christ looks like in action. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul says, he says, the old me 
was crucified with Christ. I was crucified. My old life was crucified with Christ. I died with Jesus. And so now it is not I who live, but Christ lives in me. This is what he says. Christ is living in me. As God's masterpiece, this is what he wants you to do is live as Christ would live and show the world what it looks like when he interacts with others. Do you know how, I mean, think about right now in your mind, your next door neighbors. Think about your next door neighbors. How does Jesus feel about your next door neighbors? Think he likes them? Think he loves them? Do they know how Jesus feels about them? by the way you interact with them? How does, how does Jesus feel about people that are broken? About people that are, that are stuck in addictions? About people that are enslaved to money? How does he respond to violence and abuse and depression? You know, whenever you and I find ourselves in those situations, where we're facing those situations, right then, right there, right there, live as God's masterpiece. Reflect the master's heart, the artist's creative touch into that situation. And I know that's hard, right? I mean, we think about some of the situations we find ourselves in, and it's hard to think about representing God in that moment. Sometimes, I know, right? It's not fun to think about. We heard Moses' response when God told him he wanted him to do this. We heard Jeremiah's response when he, when he heard that God wanted him to do this, right? We know our gut reaction when God wants us to do something that's hard. Our gut reaction is just please find someone else to do it. Find someone else. But you know, God equipped those guys to be his masterpiece. And God will equip you to be his masterpiece, to be who he's called you to be, so the world can know what his love looks like. You know, right now, right now, right at this moment, you are in the presence of a God who not only loves you and not only walks with you, but a God who sees the best in you, a God who sees more in you than you certainly see yourself. You know when all is said and done, what anybody has said about you, it's going to fade into the background. You know what, what you've said about yourself, when all is said and done, it's not going to matter. It is only what he says about you that will stand forever. And he says that you are his masterpiece. He believes in you. God is a good judge of character. He knows you. That's what makes you who you are. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we struggle so often seeing ourselves the way that you see us. Our focus is drawn again and again and again to the fact that we can't speak very well, that we are too young, that we have a broken past, that we're not qualified for this somehow. And yet we look at all these people in the Bible that you called to follow you and to do your work, and we look at them and say, wow, God, you can use broken people. You can use us. We pray, Father, that you would call to us wherever we are right now and help us, if we haven't done this yet, to hold on to the hand of Jesus, which changes the way that you see us. Father, help us to say yes to the calling that you've given to us. Help us to resist those who want us to look backwards and judge us based on the past. It's not who we are anymore. And so we pray, Lord, that you lead us forward into who you are making us. We trust in you, and we keep our eyes on you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.